So this is the second part of, um, of our interview. And just to pick up on that last question that um, where you'd been talking about the reaction mm -hmm. of the British establishment essentially um, to the Rhodes Must Fall movement, which was extraordinary and um, total. Mm. Can you now talk about how the movement in Oxford responded to that attack? Mm. So what, what was, um, in what ways were you able to intervene mm -hmm. effectively and get your, get your voice heard? Mm. So I'm actually going to start by talking about myself. Uh, I was in Zimbabwe where, where most of these comments were being made, um, and a lot of them were made just before I returned to Oxford. So I came back to find the campus very divided, um, to find that roads must fall uh, were the words on everybody's lips. This is what people were talking about, arguing about, thinking about. As such, I was asked to give a range of talks to present my perspective on these questions in many different settings. I spoke at my college about this, I spoke at the um, Oxford Marxist Society, and I also spoke um, at other universities, including um, SOAS, the University College London, and Edinburgh University within the period that followed. And almost invariably, I started all my talks the same way. I quoted uh, the late uh, professor of comparative literature, um, Edward Said, uh, celebrated intellectual, uh, literary critic and theoretician, and often considered the founding father of postcolonial studies. Now, in 1993, Edward Said gave the BBC's Wreath Lectures. His were entitled Representations of the Intellectual. Uh, there's a particularly poignant quote, which I don't have in front of, with, of me, but I will paraphrase. And he writes that the role of the intellectual is to articulate a view, a philosophy, an attitude, or opinion, and that this role cannot be played without a sense of edge, without being someone who says it is to question dogma and orthodoxy, and to foreground the histories of people who are routinely forgotten and swept under the rug, rather than merely reproduce the agendas or ideologies of a corporation, a government, or in this case, a university. Now, the reason I start off by talking about this quote is it shows how history and conceptions of history, or if you like, historical consciousness, became the key battleground for debates about Rhodes Must Fall. So the establishment reaction that I had highlighted in the first half showed a framing of history that was ultimately benign. British colonialism may have been violent in parts, but it bequeathed a lot of good to its benighted locales. Meanwhile, we were trying to point out that in presenting this image, there were many people whose histories were forgotten or swept under the rug. And that in excavating those histories, we come to a richer understanding of both events as they happen and, and a more complex understanding of our humanity, where we locate our thinking and how we come to value certain types of people over others. Within that context, um, speeches like mine, as well as those of many of my colleagues, featured on the media and became part of a discussion about the importance of symbols and iconography, but also about how debates about history lead us to questions of experiences within the present. Um, and I think that we did well on a number of registers. We garnered a huge um, degree of attention. Um, we got people starting within the university starting to think much more squarely about what they teach and why they teach what they teach and whether they were doing enough to revise um, curricula, for instance. Uh, at the same time, I think we made some strategic mistakes. This is also something that we need to think about critically and reflexively. Uh, in thinking a lot about the past, we often deployed metaphors of alienation, exploitation and oppression within racialized uh, overtones. As such, to some extent, our statements kind of, uh, if you like, they reified 
a perception of black history as being one of unequivocal suffering. And in so doing, we kind of elided experiences of agency and creativity, as well as creating quite an oppositional frame between what we were trying to do and the opposition that, oh, sorry, and the institution we were working within. Now, the reason I point that out is um, as the deba debate became more and more polar, it became harder for certain people within the university um, to engage with us, and compromise became quite challenging. Uh, so there were genuine questions to be asked. Is there any halfway ground between um, the, the removal of the statue and trying to preserve it? Um, what would that halfway house look like? Um, are there ways in which questions around diversity or decolonization can take place in ways that make sense to certain British or Oxford sensibilities, but that which would also satisfy the activists. And as most of these things come down to in life, it's about politics and it's about money. Uh, ultimately, with regards to the statue, the donors to Oriel College within its alumni network threatened to withdraw substantial funding from the college um, if they removed the statue. So that shut down that debate. Oriel issued a statement uh, in late January saying that they were keeping the, 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 the statue up, they were abandoning their consultative process, and uh, a letter was leaked to the press showing that the primary impetus for doing this was neither a thoughtful and co or considered appraisal of the situation, but was rather the impetus of keeping their alumni network, wealthy old men I might add, happy. At the same time, we in the movement became um, angrier and were putting a message out there that while urgent and important, used a kind of language that some people found alienating with respect to questions of violence and so forth. And so I think that we found ourselves in something of a double bind. Um, on the one hand, saying something that was really important, but at the same time alienating potential allies. Uh, and then also contending with an institution for whom power and money were held such a decisive sway that we perhaps couldn't form the right kinds of uh, allies who might be able to sway to weigh in against the power and money. Um, and this is the nature of, of navigating student politics. So, in my personal opinion, I think what happened was the university decided to suck up the blows, to be indicted within student rhetoric, but ultimately to not respond and to wait for that wave of activity to pass. Okay, thank you very much. Can you, we'll come on to some of the political questions and intellectual questions that you've already touched on, but can you talk a little bit about the future of the Rhodes Must Fall movement in Ox Oxford. Maybe touch on um, its ramifications across other campuses mm. in the UK. How do you see that in um, developing in the next in the next few months, mm. next year? So I think to to consider the future of Rhodes Must Fall, one needs to look at what's happened in the last few months. Um, I mentioned a few universities that have taken some of these questions seriously. Um, SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, held a panel um, called Why the Decolonized University. They took on board the questions raised by Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford, as well as the Why is My Curriculum White uh, movement. Uh, and in talking about why the decolonized the university, they began to talk about how can a university seriously um, accommodate, take into account, and in fact craft itself with the project of emancipation through scholarship at its heart. Um, and I think we've seen some really productive conversations happening there. In the politics department, to give one example, they've actually started teaching a module called Decolonizing the World, uh, in which they discuss the relationships between colonialism and imperialism and the formation of Western modernity, as well as the kinds of scholars who've been writing against this from different vantage points. Um, so that's been an interesting development. Um, at Edinburgh University held uh, a conference at the end of April this year, also on decolonizing the academy. Uh, wherein discussions were held about identity, about epistemology, about power, and about the academic space. Uh, and that was 
you know, spearheaded and led by academics within the university. So these are not um, renegade student activists. These are people taking, listening to and um, taking cognizance of these debates and thinking, what can we do within our university spaces? Um, other universities that have taken an interest in this range from uh, Royal Holloway to uh, Warwick University, I've already mentioned UCL. So certainly within the UK, um, these debates are coming to life and are starting to shape the ways in which people um, talk about these questions. I think they're also giving a vocabulary both to students and faculty to talk about things that they don't think are quite right with respect to questions of race or colonial legacies. These also dovetail to events that are happening in the United States. Prominent examples would be uh, the University of uh, uh, Amherst in Massachusetts, that changed um, its mascot, uh, Lord Joff, who was a slave owner. Um, Harvard Law School uh, removed um, a symbol from its logo, its crest, again because of its connections to slavery. Less successfully, Yale University tried to change the name of one of its houses, Calhoun College. Um, Calhoun again being a major slave owner. But the point being that the debate is, is, is happening and is happening apace. Um, and then, of course, there have been the event in South Africa with Rhodes Must Fall and Fees Must Fall. And so I think that in three different corners of the world, we're seeing these movements within in communication with each other. And so my, I suspect that we're only going to be seeing more of this uh, in future. I think that we're also going to be seeing questions of... Um, what does it mean now to, to take these questions forward? I've given the examples of, of Edinburgh and SOAS, but different universities will need to respond to these questions in their own way. Uh, and so I think that we're actually in for quite an exciting time in terms of looking at how curriculum and questions of representation and iconography are going to evolve, but it's not going to be an easy road as the example of Yale shows us. No, I mean, this is com completely fascinating and very exciting. In, a, in about a year, you're talking already about places, universities, curriculums that have taken on board, have been forced to take on board some of the demands of this movement, which is by any measure a, mm. an, impressive, um, um, an impressive list for any social movement. Mm. Now, just finally, could you talk a little bit, and I know you've already touched on it, the, some of the politics that have emerged and the theories that have emerged um, in the last year in the different movements. And you've spoken about the relationship between what was happening in South Africa mm -hmm. and what was happening here. In South Africa, it seemed that the, the politics of roads must fall and then fees must fall um, became developed in lots of different ways, mm -hmm. but underpinning it was the desire to decolonize the university, mm, mm. an urgent mm -hmm. um, an urgent job for, for many South African, if not most South African universities. But the language of, um, of blackness, the importance mm. of um, ridding the university of mm. its association with theories mm. and figures of a colonial past and thinkers of a colonial, colonial past. Could you, so could you talk about some of that, some of the developments of those politics um, that sit with this movement in its various places, mm -hmm. spaces? So I would say, and again, this is my personal opinion, um, my observation is that there were two broad strands of ideas um, that converged within Oxford. Um, from movements elsewhere. There are all the, the kinds of theories and ideas around decolonization and blackness that came from South Africa, those fed into the debates in Oxford. Then there are also questions about what's happening in the United States, particularly questions framed within Black Lives Matter, but also strands of thinking that are popularly associated with the United States. So people, uh, figures and intellectuals like Kimberly Crenshaw and her concept of intersectionality, showing how different uh, types of oppression can intersect within the experience of given individuals. You know, that notion also came to bear on the framing of debates here. And also naming white supremacy. I think that this is again something that has particular salience in the United States context. 
uh, where I think we can comfortably and honestly say that any notion of post-racialism um, is little more than naivety. Um, it is a deeply racially divided society, uh, economically, politically, and socioculturally. Um, concepts and ideas of whiteness, you know, inscribe themselves. And I think that some of the language there came in and was borrowed and adopted here. Now, the challenge that we have in Oxford and the challenge that we have in the UK is the UK, you know, needless to say, is not a colony as such. What does it mean to talk about decolonization in the heart of empire? There is some conceptual richness, but also confusion in that term. And I think both within the movement and without it, we have been debating back and forth about how this term should be used and how do we create resonance and purchase with people in the UK interested in radical politics, but for whom the frame of decolonization um, is not as obvious as it would be in South Africa. And similarly, with questions of race, the UK has serious questions and issues of race, but that, again, do not directly mirror what happens in the United States. Um, that's partly due to uh, differences in, in um, policing practices and gun laws that make uh, instances of racial discrimination less spectacular, less obvious than they are uh, in the US. There's also the question of different categories uh, of racial discrimination and oppression. Uh, we look at discrimination against people, say, of Polish descent uh, or Islamophobia. So I think that Rhodes Must Fall is, in, is wrestling with these questions. Because of the influence of international students, particularly from the US uh, and from South Africa, or from Southern Africa, and the prominence of black students within the movement, forming these cross cutting solidarity, solidarities and alliances with other groups is a challenge, you know. What are the kinds of uh, concepts that we can use to bring all of that together? And unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that as yet. I think that this is an ongoing and iterative process. I think that we've started off borrowing ideas from elsewhere and begun a debate, but we've also begun an intellectual process of starting to think about what emancipation uh, and emancipatory politics looks like and should be framed as. Fantastic. And then a ch cheeky last question. Mm. Could you reflect in the context of what um, what we've just we've been discussing, what you've told me about the, the movement, about your own experiences in Oxford and the UK? Can you talk about the development of your own political ideas. You mentioned mm. attending, and this will be interesting particularly for the review of African political economy, but not exclusively, but at a um, meeting of a um, Marxist society. Mm -hmm. So could you discuss how the left has involved themselves mm -hmm. um, in, in some of the struggles you're talking about, but also um, place that in a personal story. Mm. So I first arrived in the UK age 16 um, on a scholarship to attend a very elite Catholic boarding school. Uh, yeah, you poor thing. <laughs> I arrived at the school uh, to be uh, met on the one hand with outstanding teaching and world-class facilities and a shocking degree of uh, antiquated traditions um, self-importance and at times xenophobia. Um, I then proceeded to go to a medical school in the northeast of England where I was for six years at uh, Newcastle, a very post-industrial working class white part of the country where questions of race were really not especially prominent. Uh, class certainly, but I didn't quite neatly fit in to people's political categories when I arrived there. Medicine itself as a discipline, as, as, as a profession, um, is on the conservative end of things. Um, it's not uh, an arena of work that is particularly um, aligned with um, you know, radical change. It, it's hierarchical, it's discipline uh, in, in the sense of adhering to um, authoritative instructions. Um, it's very oriented in that way. Now, at the same time, medicine can also be a, a great breeding ground for the, 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 the 
uh, forming of more radical ideas. Um, at medical school, I was confronted repeatedly with uh, illness and suffering that is highly inequitably distributed. It is no accident that most of my infectious disease patients were migrants from Africa. It is no accident that many of my patients with industrial lung disease were old white men um, retired from the shipyards. It is no accident that um, our patients with alcoholic liver disease, for instance, were people um, who had been retrenched, um, had little prospects for employment, and were left with um, truncated uh, professional prospects and aspirations. And so I think within that, um, I found a conceptual space to begin to think about the world around me and about myself, to think about these questions of of, of race, class, gender, and how they structure our experiences of the world. And it was ultimately these experiences that turned me towards the social sciences. I had mentioned at the start of this interview that I studied the politics of a cholera outbreak. Um, and given my medical background and my social science training, uh, I've come to see disease and suffering as a prism through which to expose inequalities within a society, and particularly those inequalities that map onto social economic and political indicators. Um, and so I think that that was how I came uh, to form my own political ideas. Um, and so in that sense, it felt very natural um, to be part of Rhodes Must Fall as something that was trying to talk about people who are forgotten, be they, in this case, we're talking about uh, colonial subjects from the past and their descendants in the present. Um, but the same style of argument and mode of analysis applies to the shipyard worker or the migrant or, you know, the, tr the retrenched, um, you know, young man living in the northeast of England. As such, I see a natural alliance between these new student movements and the classic left, if you like. Um, and certainly groups within Oxford, like the Oxford Marxist Society, were amongst the first um, to join up and stand up in solidarity with Rhodes Must Fall, but as did the Palestinian Society and Arab SOC, various environmental activists looking to both decolonize and decarbonize. Um, and so I think that um, you have a potentially wonderful merger of different people who are wanting to think critically about the world and point out that there is a common logic to the systems that oppress us all in different ways. Magnificent. Thank you very much for the interview. It's a great pleasure. Let me get this chair.